Okay, hey guys. Gonna get started here. Presents. Okay. okay, so hi, I'm Kenzie. I'm the design lead at ERM, and today I'm gonna walk you through a presentation about world building. We recently discovered world building as a method to shape the future of ERM. So we plan on applying that to our community, but first we wanted to share the things we learned about storytelling, because writing fiction is a tool that's really overlooked in business and politics. So we wanted to give you a glimpse as to what this creative brainstorming method has the power to do. This is going to act kind of like a college lecture where I'm gonna flip through slides and show you guys video clips, um, but this is my first time doing anything like this. So bear with me a little bit. I'm gonna try and keep it smooth. Um, so this is what, we're gonna go over, I just said world building and then our vision of the future. Like I said though, at the heart of today's lesson is storytelling. Even though we're talking about the future, past stories are integral to where we're going. So we already posted an antiquity video with some of our inspirations, but this is going to primarily focus on how storytelling is used to form empathy and impact communities. Um, and I just kind of explained what world building is, but we're going to start off with some examples and then get into what we've created so far for ERM. So let's get into it. Um, brands today are holding themselves to an increasingly high standard. And as mentioned here in Bo Burnham's song, many have stepped way beyond selling a product and have gone into politics, technology, art, and more. It's been really weird to see how corporations have navigated the change times during the pandemic and some have been better and more in touch about it than others. So this is where world building comes in, not just as a way for brands to sell to people, but as a way you can design your life and the movements that you care about. So world building is all about using existing elements to inform a futuristic science fiction place where stories can play out. Think of it as an experimental testing ground. We can use it as an exercise to flip our current reality upside down, to imagine futures and solutions to things we never could have fathomed. We're creating answers to problems before they happen. These things have real world applications and opportunities. And a lot of times we view these stories as just entertainment or fun what if scenarios that keep us busy for a little while. A book series for many is just a way to pass the time. But science fiction has inspired countless patents and real world solutions to the point where many executives make it a point to read these fantasies as a way to brainstorm their next moves. Alex McDowell is considered the master of world building and he takes it even a step further than that. Um, so like I said, a number of companies have realized the importance of storytelling and hired these specialized individuals to dream up their future for them. And Alex McDowell is one of those people. He's also probably the most renowned out of all of the world builders out there. So he's worked on plenty of famous movies like Minority Report and Fight Club, but we're gonna take just a moment here to look at one of his more recent projects he assisted with, which is called Ready Player One. Okay, so I'm just going to flip through the trailer to explain the movie, some of its key themes and its importance. We start by being introduced to Wade Watts, a teenager living in post-apocalyptic Columbus, Ohio. The world has become really bleak, and so many people choose to escape to a virtual world called the Oasis. Here, they can play games and earn points that have become something like real currency in the physical world. This is really interesting because we're already seeing this happen in games like Counter-Strike, where people in countries with poor economies will spend all day playing these games and winning things they can sell for real money. It's a small amount, but it adds up to being a decent salary in a lot of places. We then go on to learn that this, there are entire companies that have formed to do this exact same thing we just mentioned, because the Oasis economy has become so tied to success in the physical world. Like anything else, large corporations have a leg up on the average user and are attempting to take control over the Oasis to control people in real life. This is a really cool way to explore some of our fears about the metaverse and the free market through the lens of a sci-fi story that has a lot of ties to real life. There we go, that was Ready Player One. So who is this guy, Alex McDowell, and how has he been responsible for creating some of the most interesting worlds the public has ever been immersed in? We've got a bit of his history here, but he currently defines his work as being part of narrative media and creative direction. His life began in Borneo, where his family was made up of architects and engineers. 
He went in the direction of the arts and um, he launched a really successful career designing for Sex Pistols, Vivian Westwood, Iggy Pop and more. So during the years, he uh, kept designing sets for all of these artists and it eventually evolved into him working in film. He's created this system for world building that is taught and utilized by countless people today. I've got a quote from in here that says, world building is about understanding a world deeply enough that the stories and narratives spring effortlessly from its fabric. It's similar to the very beginning of storytelling, making sense of the world around us. We're back into that place. We have to make sense of the world around us when it is unimaginable, dark, complicated, and unknown. Basically, it does come back to the idea of grounding. So here we're gonna get into a couple quick examples of corporations using world building. Um, Ford is a company that has kept the same logo for over a hundred years, but they still remain on the pulse of today. Uh, here they're examining smart cities and how they will affect motor vehicles. An interesting part of this is how they're suggesting these cities actually use less cars, which is a totally different takeaway than you might've expected from them. Less road space and more public transit. Without world building, I'm sure the result would have been very different. Rather than struggling against the tide to keep their company the same, they're embracing it and letting it bring them to wide open spaces with way more opportunity. So Nike has also explored a brand new world in which soccer has become democratized in Brazil. They describe a scene in which their main character plays as officials examine his statistics using health monitoring technology. These worlds are usually flattering to the client and they might also describe new products that could be invented. So then we get into intellectual property. Um, so an idea is valuable currency now. We're seeing this reflected in NFTs and patents. And in this case, world building, ideas are gold. Fiction isn't just fun. It's a necessary part of life and art at this point. Those who realize this are beginning to monetize it while others diminish its importance. So we've talked about how important world building is, but then you have to use it to tell a story. Stories are how we learn. Everything is pattern recognition. Data is rooted in reality, but stories bring it to life. And it's way more impactful if your audience can participate in it. This is called interactive storytelling. So you may remember those choose your own adventure books from when you were a kid, but they kind of fell out of vogue for a while. Um, and now streaming services are bringing it back. So we're gonna take a look here at Netflix's debut piece into interactive storytelling. So Bandersnatch is a choose your own adventure style story that you can watch on your TV. It allows you to build your own movie with each action you choose unlocking a different part of the story. In this case, we open to Stefan, a young video game developer in the 70s. He's working on his first game and we get to control his journey in doing so. We're making choices for this person in the past and then watching it play out, sometimes all the way up to the modern day repercussions our choices make. This is a really cool concept because you can begin to explore things like teaching children about history through the guise of a choose your own fate story. Show them a person in the past and give them two options every time they hit a crossroads. They can see the effects that actually played out in history and then what possibly could have happened had they made another choice. History is doomed to repeat itself if we don't learn from it, and this gives people a safe way to explore different paths. In Netflix's piece, the characters keep making references to how it's impossible to change the past. And as the character starts to go a little crazy, the viewer does as well. It's hard to keep track of all the choices you made and it ends up as an intricate map of decisions. You're making decisions, but are you really in control or given that illusion by the director? So there we go. Now we've got a taste of that. So I'm gonna show you a different kind of interaction. There are a ton of online communities that have spun off of popular fiction, and a lot of them even end up adding to the stories themselves. So one of the most popular examples of world building is Dungeons and Dragons. This gives the user a set universe and basically allows them ownership to invent whatever they want with it. So the creator is giving up control to the consumer and allowing them to turn it into something much bigger than it originally was. The story isn't complete without the player taking part in it. The Magnus Archives is a horror podcast that had an episode come out every week. 
It started as just a way to tell creepy stories, but the fan base absolutely blew up on Tumblr and gave the Magnus archives the ability to grow a lot bigger and to turn the story into something more intricate and involved. The SCP Foundation is a great example of online collaborative writing projects uh, because it started as a fictional world about a containment unit where monsters are kept. The creators laid the foundation and introduced a few characters and then the community took off. Today, it has its own wiki with hundreds of characters and thousands of pieces of writing related to their stories. The idea never would have grown as big as it did without the community taking over and adding work. When world building for our organization, we always want to allow our participants to shape the future of it. We have to stay organized, but also be nimble and adapt to changes that might make our future a little bit different. So audio dramas have taken your classic campfire story and cranked it up to 10 with surround sound and immersive noises that make you feel as if you're living alongside the character. We think back to fables and how they were orally passed between people to teach lessons, and it's kind of being reflected here. You'll see a few of these audio dramas are commenting on real life issues, and it kind of helps you empathize with the situations. So to introduce you to the audio dramas, we're first gonna start by explaining the edge of sleep. This is an eight part show that explored a dystopian nightmare in which one day in the future, everyone who goes to sleep one night dies. Those who stayed awake long enough to realize what was happening now face uncertainty while popping pills that keep their eyes open long enough to solve the mystery. It was one of the first audio dramas out there and it doesn't have a lot of real world takeaway, but it's a great experiment into how you can build a world with just voice actors and sound effects. The audio drama examines ethics and scientific research through the lens of a mystery fictional narrative. Um, it's recently been made into a TV show, but we have just a quick clip from the podcast here to give you an idea of what it's like. Let's see if it plays where I have it. Yep. Mind reading. Reading implies work. This is a link. Imagine every child born is immediately implanted with a small metal pill the size of an aspirin conductive on one side, able to pick up the billions of electrical bursts that constitute human thought, decode them, and send that signal out to its brothers and sisters implanted elsewhere. You can only hear it if you have it. That's... Impressive is the word you're searching for. I was going to say monsters. Ah, well, at a 50-50 chance. Um, so like we said with the other ones, people are still making real world connections to it and comparing ethical dilemmas like with some of these headlines. Um, so it's clear that storytelling can help us explore issues of morality, but can it also help us form empathy? So to bring you into this, the beginner's guide is the first one we're going to go over. And the beginner's guide is an interactive story, a game that anyone can play on their computer that forces the user to solve a mystery a mystery about the game's creator. It focuses on the relationships between developers, the creative process, and consumers, making a social statement via a puzzle that people must go through to understand, or hacking empathy. The concept of this game is based on trying to understand the nature of a person by exploring files on their computer without ever knowing them. In the game, the player, aided by creator Davey, looks to understand a game developer named Coda, who Davey had met at a conference in 2009. Coda has created numerous strange game ideas, which he then stored away. The player explores these games that were only half created and is encouraged by Davey's narration to try to imagine what Coda's personality would have been like based on his game spaces and ideas. The beginner's guide shows the chronological progression of Coda's work as the developer learned more and eventually comes to a heart-wrenching ending. So most people only had really strong reactions to this, as you can see browsing these YouTube comments and other communities. And I'm not gonna spoil the ending, but it does offer up a unique point of view that you really need to complete the game to understand. The interpretations of this quick game got really philosophical and it does feel like you're kind of walking around the creator's brain, feeling his anxieties, fears and loneliness. And it definitely is worth a dive into Reddit to kind of read people's interpretations on this. And I would definitely recommend going through the game as well. Uh, so our next example for this section is probably the most impressive example of manufacturing empathy on here. 
Teen girls are usually not taken seriously. Uh, the world ridicules the music they like, the emotions they feel, the way they dress, and the things that are important to them. So wouldn't that be the greatest lesson in empathy if you could get the whole world to relate to a teenage girl for a 90-minute runtime? Eighth Grade is a 2018 American coming-of-age comedy drama film written and directed by Bo Burnham. Um, it stars Kayla, a middle school teenager who struggles with anxiety, but strives to gain social acceptance from her peers during their final week of eighth grade. This was Bo Burnham's directorial debut, and the movie was really about him reflecting on his own fears and anxieties, but doing it through an underrepresented lens. Bo's 2018 Daily Show interview opens with a quick discussion about his journey as a comedian, musician, and internet personality from the time he was a teenager. When Burnham was first posting videos, the internet was a completely different place, but it still had a very large impact on his later life. When he later began performing for live audiences, his anxiety that had begun when he was a teenager only increased in severity. He would occasionally reference this during shows, and then after, he would have teenage girls coming up to him, excitedly exclaiming that they feel the exact way he does. Even though they were radically different people, it was easy to find parallels between their lives. When Bo created eighth grade, he was telling a story about the human condition while legitimizing the often scorned feelings of teenage girls. This was a really interesting way to not only tell a piece of his story, but to tell a larger story that could really make people empathize with the younger people in their lives. In the trailer here, we open up to Kayla, our main protagonist stumbling through a slightly awkward YouTube intro, kind of similar to what I'm doing now. Um, she goes into a monologue telling her viewers to be themselves, and then we see a montage of clips where she's doing the exact opposite of that. We see her dad trying and failing to connect with her, as is the case with many parents. They're just not fully understanding each other. This movie is really cool because everyone who watches it can unite in the awkwardness that is adolescence, and it can remind older people what that time was like. Cool. So now that we've gone over world building and storytelling and why it's essential for building a movement, we're going to introduce some of the groundwork we've done for physical ERM locations prior to discovering these methods. Later, we're going to update you with a video after we've applied all of McDowell's world building methods um, and created the universe a little bit more. Um, using this technique, world building, you can look this up online to figure out exactly how he does this for all of his universes. So the first thing that we've decided on prioritizing is resiliency over the sustainability buzzword. While sustainability looks at how current generations can meet their needs without compromising the ability for further generations, resilience considers a system's ability to prepare for threats, to absorb impacts, and to recover and adapt after disruptive events. So one of the bigger issues facing us is climate change. Weather is becoming increasingly severe every year. A couple of months ago, it was so hot that the internet in my location was down for over 24 hours. And for a society that entirely runs on electricity and the connectivity of the web, this is not gonna work for us. It's beyond thinking of ways to combat the weather changes. We need to think of ways to adapt to them. How will we change our infrastructure so we can continue on when things become inconducive to life? So one of the values we run on is the seventh generation principle. This philosophy says that every decision we make should have a positive impact on those seven generations into the future. This may mean planting a tree in a garden we never get to see. It's doing work for no reward now so that people can benefit later. We apply this to choosing building materials, creating products, helping families, and we'll continue to use it more often. So we just mentioned making smart building material choices and here are a few things our structures will be built out of. First, we've invested in a machine that allows us to print housing frames out of cold rolled steel. This makes it so we can put up a house in a day that is more sturdy, better for the environment, and a fraction of the cost of specialized wood framing. After that, we use things like hempcrete, mica bricks, and other snip fillers as insulation. Um, so our steel framing machine is a great example of positive automation. People are really afraid of AI taking jobs, and while it will eliminate some, it will create way more. Um, so without automation, we would still be stuck in the early days of the Industrial Revolution with people constantly dying in horrible factory conditions. 
So using this machine removed our need for many contractors, but it also created other jobs and opportunities that are safer and more creative. We get to work with more designers, hire artisans for one of a kind interiors and furniture, spend more on gardens and landscaping, add more community events, create restaurants, shops, childcare centers, and more, all for the same cost of creating those wood framed houses. So where are these houses going? They're going to be in what we call ERM zones. ERM zones are neighborhoods and buildings where our community members can always take part. There are self-sufficient areas that fund resources and jobs using our goods and services provided. There are universal rights and freedoms awarded to all inhabitants. There are safe spaces for living and creating while having your community to rely on. Here's a list of what success looks for us for members inside of these zones. They're going to have shorter work weeks, well-traveled with a global education, healthy with clean eating habits and quality food access with little additives, reformed healthcare system that prioritizes prevention of illness, close-knit community, resilient materials protecting from weather severity, reliable news sources, universal basic income, um, prioritizing family and relationships, small communities becoming self-reliant, learning something new every day, working with technology rather than having it replace us, creating heirlooms and a legacy, making choices that will have a positive effect on our future generations and shared private community networks. So Web3 is the central base for our communities. We call ERM a digital nation of supporters who want to upscale human potential and happiness. We have a decentralized governmental system where all citizens have an equally weighted vote. No one can have too much power. Our transactions will be done globally with digital currencies. People from all over the world will be able to meaningfully connect with their neighbors through the metaverse. Citizens will be able to travel anywhere in the world with ease. So we also decided that it was important to define a new language to explain all of this stuff. So since everyone comes from a different background with different understandings, we wanted to create a kind of glossary to get everyone on the same page. And we'll quickly run over a few of those words here. Resiliency, we just went over. Um, sustainability buzzword no longer means much. We know climate change is already here. Now we have to figure out how to bounce back. Economic rights movement, that's us. It's a movement that calls for financial education equality to make up for years of systemic classism and racist housing practices. An impact investor, that's you guys, an economically driven, but also socially conscious investor that wants to put their money into things they believe in. Dual return is when investors make a profitable return on investment while the community